All right, we are here with Charles Schluter, the recently retired principal trumpet of the Boston Symphony. Charlie, it's great to have you here as always. Nice to be here as always. I think as much or more than any trumpet player on the planet, Charlie has influenced me very directly as an instrument maker. And um, so I'm really looking forward to asking you a whole bunch of questions here that hopefully some other people will find interesting as well. So to start out with an obvious question, Charlie, is that you have such a totally unique uh, approach to playing, not like anything anyone has ever heard before. There's no other Charlie Schluter on the planet. Where did this come from? Well, I think it was because of the various teachers I had that each one always stressed listening to other instrumentalists and, and singers and I don't know if they exactly said I should try to emulate that but that was sort of the implication and I, I think I've always had the, the, the concept of having the widest possible dynamic range because especially for orchestral playing you have to play with woodwinds, you have to play with strings as well as playing with the brass and you can't play with the same timbre with each one of those groups so that's part of what has to change and this was always what I was trying to do on the instrument and then 25 years ago you started making instruments and you made my life infinitely easier because your instruments allowed me to do all those things I've been trying to do for all those years before so how, how much did how much do you think Bill Vacchiano and his teaching contributed to your success and your unique uh, sound well, he, he was the, the one who sort of put it all together because we never talked about the mechanics of, of playing. Uh, uh, didn't talk about embouchure, didn't talk about breathing because I had I'd been fortunate to have two previous teachers who dealt with those issues. The thing that, that uh, Bill stressed, of course, was orchestral style because that's what he had done his entire career. There, Back when I studied with him 50 years ago, there wasn't much solo repertoire. We had the Haydn Concerto, the newly discovered Hummel Concerto, which I heard the first modern performance when Catala did that at Town Hall in 1958. Uh, there were very few solo pieces, that, and there were practically no trumpet recitals. Catala was one of the first ones in New York, and then they sort of started mm -hmm. catching on. Uh, but but it, Bill's, uh, you know, his approach was orchestral style which can be adapted to any other type of playing depending on the, the context. Um, he stressed that if you want to learn about ensemble playing go hear string quartets play in concert not just the recordings. Yeah, there were a few recordings he said I should go listen to and, and, and they were very beneficial but as far as, as developing any kind of a, a concept of, of they include color as well as phrasing and nuance, you have to learn from other instruments that are more conducive to, to playing music. <laughs> mm -hmm. Charlie, you've played with many, many conductors in various orchestras for the last 45 years. How have you seen the relationship between the conductor and the individual orchestra musicians change in that time? Well, the, the, whole, the whole world of orchestral uh, the whole orchestral world has changed substantially in the last half century because uh, this, the seasons were not that long uh, when I started out there. They, the symphony orchestras were not even that attractive of a job. They, they were somewhat steady, but my first job was a 24-week season. Uh, when I first went to New York in 1957, the New York Philharmonic was on strike which I found astonishing because having grown up in coal mining country, my father had been a coal miner, I thought only coal miners went on strike. Mm -hmm. They were holding out, I think, for a 38-week season and a minimum salary of $150 a week, which sounds astounding now. Yeah, it does. So starting out in Kansas City, which they had a 24-week season, the minimum salary was, the first year was $97.50, and the next year they got a huge raise of $2.50 up to $100 a week. So. The, the orchestras really weren't very much involved. The, the, the musicians' union back then was practically non-existent, uh, and they particularly were not interested in, in orchestral uh, issues. Um, union officials were sort of intimidated and overwhelmed by 
the wealth that was involved in, in, in the boards of symphony orchestras or the managers of symphony orchestras and the amount of control. And, and the, the first couple of contracts were like, you know, of orchestra that I played were maybe two pages long. The, the, or, the conductor had total authority. He could hire or, or rather fire anybody at, at, at will, at any whim. Uh, there were no really restrictions as far as uh, most rehearsals were three hours long because uh, you know, they had to fill up the, the time. They, or was, except for the, for the so-called Big Five, New York, Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and Boston, which had more than one concert a week, these these other the smaller orchestras didn't have that that type of venue, so they 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 used up their services in rehearsals, and, and that, that uh, uh, very often they were there were extra uh, the conductor would use up the, the allotted time, and there was something called a grace period of five minutes after a rehearsal that they didn't have to pay overtime for. When he retired, Doc Severinsen commented that with Bud Herseth and Frank Katarabek also retired, your retirement was truly the end of an era. And most players we work with comment frequently that in the orchestral world, orchestral musicians seem to have less and less personality in their approach to playing. In an earlier interview, Phil Snedekor said, quote, I think the main thing orchestral musicians should be concerned with is how you go about getting people to be interested in music again. With the orchestra machine being what it is, very impersonal and note perfect, it's no wonder people are staying away in droves. What can we do as musicians to get them to back in, to get them back into the concert hall or into the CD market? The answer lies in what we as individuals do with our music, how we personalize it, and what kind of emotion we're displaying that makes people want to experience it again and again. Otherwise, they might as well stay home and watch TV. So Phil's comments, I think, are, are pretty right to the point, and I keep hearing comments like this all the time from players that I work with familiar with the orchestral world. Can you comment on this for a little bit? Yeah, we, we've, we've created a, a real double bind to the point that it, it's, it's, like, it's almost like a, a monster, like, like a Frankenstein, because on the one hand, you know, everyone has a CD player, everyone has is all sorts of video, audio equipment, and the recording techniques have, have advanced tremendously. The, the recording world has sort of killed itself because the, the only thing that kept going for the previous half century was new techniques. When they went from, from the, the 78 uh, re disc to the long play 33, then it went to stereo, then it went to um, digital and they finally you know exhausted whatever possibilities now because of the recordings <laughs> you you don't hear any glitches because you can with digital especially you can eliminate any mm. any any mistakes every now and then someone gets gets through that you know by accident so that's become sort of the norm that that you hear this perfect Kind of playing, and that has somehow oozed over in, into the the audition world. So that when people play auditions, their primary goal is to play note perfect, so that it sounds like a recording. Mm -hmm. In in many orchestras now, they even will allow recordings as the as the preliminary stage. That also has caused other problems because most people had, had like a, a a mini disc. Uh, re recording device, and a lot of orchestras before they started accepting CDs would would only want it on a cassette. There's something electronically that goes haywire when you try to you know re you know, uh, transfer a, a mini disc to a cassette. It comes out totally distorted. It sounds like the microphone was, was like stuck up your nose, never mind the bell. And you get all, you know, there's no dynamic range. There's a tremendous amount of of, of, of noise. And that was sort of discovered by accident too. One of my former students complained that his tape hadn't got accepted, and I went and listened to it. And I said, "You should listen to it because you sent it at the last minute without checking after you, before you sent it." And he called back and says, "You're right. It sounds awful." <coughs> so, you take that a step further to the live auditions, and you end up. And this is the case with many, many orchestras. You have, even for let's say a fourth trumpet job in, in an orchestra that. In, you know, 
50 years ago probably didn't even exist, and you have 200 people or more apply for this job. It gets narrowed down to you know maybe 10 or 15 people, those people who have been accurate, and you get down to the final you know two or three, and no one gets hired because of exactly what Phil just said. There is no personality, so you, you have this the double bind is where people don't want to hear your personality, but at the same time, when they don't hear your personality, they can't make a choice because everyone sounds exactly the same. It's hard to pick when, if, if, if you have varying shades of gray, I mean, if you, you know, if, if there was anything blue in there, or yellow, or green, right. you might be able to say, hey, I mean, I've heard advice given to people when playing auditions, avoid the extreme dynamics. Don't try to play anything too soft, don't try to play anything too loud. My reaction to that is, that, that's the sort of player that I wouldn't want to hear because you don't know whether they're just playing safe or if they don't have the capacity to play loud or soft. Right. Well, and that brings me to the next question.